Let's begin. So we're going to talk about subsidies and uh, universal basic income. They're obviously related in ways that will become evident as we go through the, the module. When we talk about subsidies, I, I think that I don't want to go into this in any great detail here, but basically I think all of you I'm sure will teach uh, in, in micro, in basic micro, what the, uh, you know, uh, incidence and the dead weight losses, the benefits associated with taxes and subsidies are. Uh, so just, you know, that subsidy will, if you give a subsidy that shifts the supply curve, it will benefit both producers and consumers. But we know that the fiscal cost will exceed the benefits. And so we know that the, you know, there's this triangle like this, which is the dead weight loss from, from a subsidy. And, and that I take, uh, you will, uh, I mean, the students will know this beforehand. But I think, you know, in this, I would begin teaching this with a broader macro perspective. Given that in India, subsidies are quite big, uh, and I'm going to tell you, you know, that uh, even the fertilizer subsidy, which we'll do in some detail, uh, is, is actually a macro issue. So there has to be a basic macro perspective on subsidies, uh, especially in the context of all these farm loan waivers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think the basic point needs to be brought across is that, yes, the subsidy will benefit some, but there is no free lunch in this business. There is a cost to someone else in society from this, from a macro perspective. So, so I think this is a point that you should bring across. Uh, you know, first thing is that, uh, so there are three ways of, you know, kind of dealing with subsidies from a macro level, right? One, if the fiscal deficit is unchanged, then we know that some other spending will have to decline or some other taxes will have to go up, which will hurt someone. So in, uh, you know, in maintaining a subsidy, uh, you are imposing costs on someone else uh, if the fiscal deficit remains unchanged. If the fiscal deficit increases and is financed by printing money, we know that there will be inflationary consequences and that will in turn impact on you know, whoever, but also as we saw earlier, infl inflation disproportionately affects the poor because they can't hedge themselves, they don't have assets to hedge themselves against. So. Uh, 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 someone else will, will be hurt. Third, of course, you could increase the fiscal deficit and you can finance it by increased borrowing. But then, of course, all you're doing is transferring the cost to future generations because in the future, taxes will have to go up to pay for the extra borrowing that the governments do today, or either extra taxes or reduced spending in the future. So, so a subsidy is profoundly a distributional issue. You know, the notion that, you know, when you give it to someone, it's free for them, or when you take it away from them, that you're actually penalizing only one group is not correct. I think that's a basic macro point you have to get across, I think, in the classroom. And I think, uh, I do think that a failure to uh, not, it's not so much maybe the failure to understand, but I think some of that, but also uh, a kind of refusal to recognize this does affect policies. You know, uh, when we think about, you know, let's say taking away some subsidy, we think, oh my God, the government is being very bad to one group. But we know that, you know, when you do that, there will be some benefit to some other group. Similarly, when you give a subsidy to someone, you're going to hurt someone else. That subsidies are a distributional issue, you know, no free lunch is something I think that you have to get, get across uh, in the classroom. Um, so let's see what happens in India today. This is a, a kind of uh, one way of presenting what the major central government budgetary subsidies are. Today the biggest subsidy is the food subsidy. Uh, the second biggest subsidy is the petroleum subsidy. Uh, sorry, fertilizer. Fertilizer is the uh, second biggest, and then the others. But remember, these are major central government budgetary subsidies. In addition, you could have government's implicit subsidies, i.e., for example, by giving taxing taxes at concessional rates, that's an implicit subsidy, which, which also... Uh, governments can provide off-balance sheet uh, subsidies, for example, to the banks, uh, and that's not captured in this. Similarly, not just the state governments, but cent uh, not just the central government, but state governments provide subsidies. Power, water are all very good examples. 
So when we talk about, you know, when you look at the central government budget uh, and look at the numbers, that kind of is not a complete picture of the total subsidies that are provided by the government. Now, this, I mean, if you want a truly comprehensive picture, I mean, you have to do a lot of detailed and very careful calculations. In the first survey that we did um, in 2015-16, in I mean, we computed that it was something like 4.2% of GDP. There's a table in that survey which you should look at. Um, but I think even that is neither up to date nor comprehensive. I think NIPFP has did a study some time ago, which they're updating, uh, which in which I think the numbers are much bigger. Central and state government subsidies are, are considerably larger. But so, so that's something that again you might want to you know familiarize your students with uh, the fact of you know what is what is a subsidy. Uh, what are the major central government subsidies, but also what is not captured uh, in the central government budget loan. If you, if you look at it, the interesting thing, of course, is that if you look at the, at the time um, pattern of what happened to these three major subsidies, the big change, of course, is that you know, uh, the oil subsidy was the, was the largest subsidy uh, you know, at a time when oil prices peaked. Uh, the food subsidy was lower, but then with the implementation of the NFSA, I mean, it's, it's been ramped up, and the fertilizer subsidy uh, has been kind of flat. So there's a dot there. This is in absolute numbers on the left-hand side uh, as a percentage of GDP on the right-hand side. Uh, you know, I always like to look at it more as a share of GDP, uh, and what you find the same pattern. So that So that red dot actually is... Uh, in all these subsidies, you should l look at not just uh, what um, you know the headline number is, but also there are arrears on these subsidies. So uh, the, the actual magnitudes could be uh, considerably bigger. In the case mm -hmm. of the fertilizer subsidy, you see that including arrears, it's about 0.7, 0 0.8% of GDP, and, and, and so it's, it's quite, quite substantial. So why are, we, why are we choosing today, or why have I chosen to focus on the fertilizer subsidy? Uh, Partly because in, in my first year here, you know, we did spend a lot of time on this, trying to you know, in, uh, you know, uh, provide inputs into policy making. But uh, uh, so, so we've done a lot of work which we want to share with you, uh, and in turn you could share with the students. But also because you know, it's funny that when you, um, when you go to most countries uh, and you say you want to do macroeconomics, you know, the fertilizer is never something that is, you know, becomes a macroeconomic issue. But in the Indian case, fertilizers are a, a, a macroeconomic issue because of the magnitude. 0.8% of GDP is a lot. I mean, if you kind of uh, you know, use that for some other program, or, or, or reduce the deficit, uh, reduce the debt, it could have major macro complications. So uh, fertilizers are a, a, a very, you know, uh, are really in India, are a macroeconomic fiscal issue, but also because I think that um, you get, what's interesting about fertilizer is it shows a kind of Indian policy making ingenuity and, you know, brilliance. How can you come up with such a, massively complicated uh, subsidy structure. So it tells you the Indian mind in some extent, to some extent. And, and also the manner in, it, in which it's implemented, I think highlights a number of very, very rich lessons in economics. So I think it's you know, really, uh, for me, fertilizer, when you think about fertilizer, my juices start flowing because I, I, I think it's such, a, such an interesting, but also you know, it, it makes you wonder why we have uh, such a scheme in the first place. One important difference between the fertilizer subsidy and the food, petroleum, and kerosene subsidies in India is that the fertilizer subsidy is not capped. Any in the case of urea or indeed any other, uh, the other uh, fertilizers, any farmer can go and get any amount of money at the subsidized rate, uh, any amount of fertilizer. In the case of food, as we know, it's capped. Uh, uh, in the case of kerosene, it's capped. Uh, you, uh, and in the case of LPG also, I think it's 12 cylinders. So, uh, so, so in that sense, the fertilizer is quite uh, interesting. Uh, it's, it's an uncapped, you know, kind of unlimited, you know, you can uh, get as much as you want uh, at a subsidized price. There are no limits on the fertilizer subsidy. There are three uh, kinds of, um, well, actually, there are three major products in India, three fertilizer products. 
they're called N, P, and K. Basically, it's, it's urea, DAP, and MOP. Uh, don't worry about all the details. But urea, we subsidize at about 206%. What we do is, for, in the case of urea, we fix the price that the farmer can buy it at. So the, the farmer price is fixed at about 5360. That's for urea, but for, for uh, the, uh, the other subsidies, which are phosphorus and potassium based, we now give a per unit subsidy. Uh, the, the manner in which it's calculated is based on the underlying nutrients. That's why it's called the NBS, the nutrient based subsidy. But essentially, in the case of urea, the farmer price is fixed. And so if world prices change or costs change, uh, the, the burden of extra or lower subsidy goes to the government. In the case of the other two things, uh, the subsidy rate is fixed. So if there are changes in prices, the farmer has to you know, bear the, 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 the kind of either if prices go up, I mean, he will have to pay more. If prices come down, he will have to pay less. But with urea, it's the other way around. If prices go up, the government ends up spending more. Prices come down, the government ends up spending less. So one is a fixed price and the other is a fixed subsidy. And so these, are, these have different consequences in terms of what happens, who bears the burden when underlying costs and prices change. What you find is that we favor urea a lot in India, and you can see that uh, urea is subsidized at 206%, whereas the other two are subsidized at about 50, 60%. So we really, really favor the use of urea through our subsidy. Um, and of course, the expenditure also, you can see, is two and a half times uh, on urea as it is on the other two combined. Uh, this is for, I think, 1516 or 1617, one of the two, the latest, it's, it's the latest we have. So what, what are the consequences of this? Uh, I've told you this, in fact, this is something you may want to show your students about the analytics of this, what happens with urea, what happens with this. This is my favorite cordon diagram. World prices go up. In the case of urea, prices go up. In that case, it's the subsidy. Uh, prices go up, subsidy remains the same. I mean, it's interesting that you know, when we talk about you know, prices in the case, one thing you find with this is that farmers respond to subsidies and prices very, very quickly and perceptibly. You can see it in the data. So the blue line here is the ratio of use of urea to uh, 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 K is, is potash, which is uh, MOP. And the green line is the ratio of N to P. Again, so uh, uh, see how amazing this is. So when P and, P, P and K prices are decontrolled so that they go up, uh, the urea consumption goes up, i.e. the consumption of the substitute product goes up. Similarly, when the subsidy comes down, the use of these two come down is uh, increase uh, all the way here. And again, when the NBS policy was instituted, the prices went up again. So the use of urea went up and the use of, of uh, P and K came down. So don't let anyone tell you that farmers don't respond to prices. Farmers respond to prices. Prices matter, subsidies determine, prices and subsidies do determine you know, input use, output uh, behavior by farmers, and you can see that very clearly in the data here. So I, I don't want to, I mean, part of the reason why I, I got uh, you know, uh, interested in this is urea, for example, we're going to focus on urea now. So we have three kinds of fertilizers. We have different uh, subsidy regimes. Now I want to focus a, a bit on urea. Essentially, as I said, what happens is that we set the, the farmer price. And then what we do is we provide a subsidy to all the domestic producers. And I'm going to come to this. It's one of the most crazy things that we do. Uh, and we also subsidize import. So for example, you know, if demand is 10, domestic producers produce 7, imports are 3. We subsidize the 7, and we subsidize the 3. Um, but then over and above, and the subsidy on imports is also pretty, pretty kind of uh, interventionist. And in addition, of course, what we do is that we don't allow free imports of urea. Urea has to be imported by three agencies, two public sector, one private sector. And so it's called canalization. I mean, if you were to tell someone that in 2017, uh, 25 years after we uh, you know, liberalize the economy, that we still have monopoly or quasi-monopoly imports of a product like fertilizer, 
I mean, people would think you're, you know, uh, you know, when did we leave the socialist Raj behind? I, I think we haven't done that, uh, and we still, you know, kind of, uh, we don't have free imports of fertilizers. Now, uh, finally, we also, you know, regulate if you, you know, if fertilizers produced in point A, which fertilizer will go to from A to B, how it will go, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are, are, are also is also regulated. So this is a highly regulated sector, uh, a highly regulated product, and hence it creates a lot of distortions. And we want to see what these uh, distortions are. Um, the first is uh, something that we, we, we didn't see, is that the ideal ratio for urea and the other two is four is to two is to one. Because urea prices are subsidized to the extent of you know, 200 plus percent, we see that the India average ratio, you know, the ideal ratio is four is to two. I mean, in, 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 it's almost double that all over India. But if you look at Punjab, it's like you know, off the charts. Um, uh, I'm going to, so this is a chart, in fact, of the distortion in the relative use of, of the urea and the potash subsidy. You see, for example, um, I want you to look at the scale. The first one is drawn on a reasonable scale, but then we can't fit in Rajasthan, Haryan, Punjab on the same scale because the distortion is not in, it's like uh, uh, Latin American inflation rates, 3,000%, 4,000%. So, so that's the kind of distortion we get uh, in urea. And therefore, what's been happening, and we'll do this to, to some extent in the agriculture section, uh, soil quality has, I mean, deteriorated, and it's created health hazards. There is something called a cancer train that goes from a Muktsar district in Punjab. I don't know where it goes to, but cancer rates there, um, 136, whereas I think the national average is something like 80, uh, is, uh, uh, 80 uh, per 1 lakh population. So, I mean, so the, the consequence of subsidizing urea on is very clear both in terms of soil quality and in terms now also of health. So this is the first big distortion from the kind of things we do in the fertilizer sector. Uh, the NPK ratio 4 to, 1, uh, 4 to 1 is for all India. In Rajasthan's case there is a K already in the soil so we can't have 4 to 1 for them. So, I mean, uh, we need to have state specific. Yeah, so I, I think there are spe state specific, yeah. I guess it is 4 to 1 taken for all, and then uh, yeah. we have calculated the list. Yeah, we, we, I, I guess we have to do this all India level, and, and we, we could, I mean, you could do it state, state specific. specific uh, NPK ratio, what should be the ideal one, and from that we should calculate the list. Uh, I can safely say that in Punjab, it will not be 61.72. Yeah. 61 no. yeah. No, but the point is well taken. I think uh, uh, this is something that uh, maybe th there is a state state specific calculation of this as well, and, and we should look into that. Yeah, that's uh, certainly um, because soil quality varies, you know, etc. So I think that that would. Uh, okay, distortion 4500 percent will not uh, remain there because Rajasthan soil has already key. Yeah, but if it has, uh, but but I think this is you know, uh, uh, I think it shows that even allowing for that, it's 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 horrible. I think. Uh, anyway, so this is the first distortion that comes from uh, this. The the other interesting thing, and this is what I want to focus on, is that in in last year's survey we had a whole chapter on this, and we said that there are three kinds of leakages of the fertilizer subsidy. Um, and by leakage, we mean that, in a sense, whatever is not going to the deserving small farmer is kind of one definition of what the leakage is. Now, remember that uh, essentially what you've done is that in the case of uh, urea and, and these other, especially urea, you violate the law of one product, one price. You don't have one product, one price. Because you get the subsidy only for agricultural uses and uh, also because, you know, uh, in India there's a price and in, uh, in, in neighboring countries there's another price. So immediately you can see that when you violate the law of one product, one price, then you will have scope for leakage immediately. So there are two kinds of leakages that happen. Some of it is diverted to industrial uses. And, but that's one leakage which, you know, when the Prime Minister came in, he had, you know, he instituted this neem coating of urea. 
And I think uh, this is something that uh, seems to have had a, quite a big impact in terms of reducing at least di It's had an uh, impact, it seems to have, both in diversion to industrial uses, but also in terms of the absolute level of consumption. If you look at the latest consumption data, which I think someone actually you should analyze, something very interesting is going on, which we don't know entirely. Is it because of, of neem coating? Is it because of you know, less uh, uh, diversion? I think these are very interesting things to explore, uh, uh, which we should. Now, wh what is the evidence for this about the leakage? So there is data. I think this is the cost of cultivation survey 2012-13, which we analyzed in the survey. So this is the percent of farmers, this is 2012-13, saying they pay above MRP for urea. And what you find is that almost everyone is paying above MRP, so there's a black market in urea. But what you find really interesting is that in Assam, Bihar, Orissa, West Bengal, certainly West Bengal, Bihar, and Assam, they're bordering states. They border uh, Bangladesh and or Nepal. And you find that because of that, there's a lot of leakage taking place outside the country, and therefore there's less availability to the farmer. And you can see clearly, therefore, the farmer ends up paying a price for this, which is that he pays, uh, well, in a sense it's a price, in a sense it's not a price, but at least in terms of official government policy, he's supposed to get it at 53.50 per, uh, per, uh, per tonne, but he gets it uh, at much, uh, much more because of this uh, distortion where you know, uh, there's a black market that's created and it goes to. So, so it's really interesting how in the border states you get actually uh, much, uh, uh, you can see the leakage to the border states in the data. Now, now comes, I think, this is for me the most uh, uh, ingenious thing that we do. So what happens is that there are, so at the moment, 30 producers of urea, and there, there are going to be seven more, 37 producers of urea. Each of them, each company will get a subsidy based on what it says is its cost of production. And if a company says, my cost is 10, you get one. If it says it's 20, it gets more. So, so the more inefficient you are, the more the subsidy that you get in the case of urea. I, I, and I think this is you know, why we do this, you know, why we continue doing this is some, something that simply uh, uh, you know, beats me. Uh, it's something, I mean, it would be so easy, for example, to say that, look, OK, we will subsidize domestic producers, but we will give everyone a uniform subsidy. You know, so those who can, you know, we're giving you protection, we'll give you some protection, we'll give you some subsidy, but say 10, 15%. But beyond that, you know, if you can't produce, you can't produce. But um, that's not what we do. We, the, the funny thing is that if you look at this, so, so this is the graph which shows the subsidy uh, per metric ton as a you know actual cost and you see and this is by definition so you get a, a perfectly fit line which you never do in statistics because by construction you give the more the, uh, the cost the more the subsidy now uh, the, the funny thing is that we don't do subsidization in this because you know there's some big employment benefit in this in the case of fertilizer most of the input costs are basically energy so this is a chart which shows how many employees in each of the plants, and this is the cost of production, and, and this line is the international price. So essentially what you know is that all those blue dots above that red line, all these dots, are inefficient producers because they're producing well above some semblance of imported price, and they don't even employ very many people. You know, you can see they employ, you know, 500, 400, 300, 200. So this is not like, you know, we're producing, providing employment for thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. But this is a very energy intensive industry. And yet we do. So this is leakage number one, as I said, goes across the border and our industrial uses. Leakage number two to inefficient producers. And the more inefficient you are, the more the leakage to that person. And the third thing we find is that <clears throat> uh, how much goes to rich farmers as opposed to uh, big farmers as opposed to small farmers. So in that, we calculated that out of 100 uh, rupees that's spent, nine is lost to inefficient firms. 36% is lost to some combination of uh, industrial uses and leaking abroad. 
22% actually goes, 22 paise goes to uh, the big farmers and only finally about one third goes to the small and marginal farmer. So if you're thinking about a policy that should benefit the poor, in this case the poor farmer, then in terms of the effectiveness of targeting, we're not doing a, a very good job. And over and above that, because of this, we've created uh, inefficient farms, we've created a deterioration in soil quality, and we are creating health hazards. So, so the fertilizer subsidy is kind of a, a, a good example of a place where you know, we should be thinking about more carefully, we should be doing, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, whether we can rationalize the system. And, you know, we can do all kinds of things. You know, for example, you can eliminate just the producer inefficiency. Yeah, sorry, your yeah, question? Yes, yes sir. What is the threshold limit of the land holding for the... Yeah, so, so, so sm small and marginal will be less than, uh, it's in the, it's less than one, one and a half or two, one and a half or two hectares. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's in the, it should be there in the presentation. Um, uh, large farmers are greater than five. So in fact, there are five categories, so small and marginal, medium and large. Yeah. Oh, can I just finish and then we take questions on fertilizers? So, so, <coughs> so this is, a, this is a, a sector that's crying out for reform uh, where uh, you, know, you can see all the, the, the costs associated and the magnitudes are big. It's 0.8% of GDP if you include the areas. And um, you know you could do all kinds of things. You could rationalize prices, and of course now what we've done, the government has done uh, in the last budget. Uh, the, the, the finance minister announced that we would start DBT, uh, you know, direct benefit transfers. There are, I think, 16 pilot districts where this experiment has started. Uh, it's 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 going to be reviewed, uh, and depending upon that, it's going to be extended. But so so this is a case where something like a DBT offers the potential to address the leakage address, um, uh, you know, to try and, 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 and begin uh, rationalizing the sector. But this is a sector that uh, uh, it, it kind of makes you wonder, uh, you know, why we have this policy. And of course, I will come back to this uh, in the last uh, session about the difficulties we have in India on exit to get out of you know uh, uh, misguided policies in India is proving very difficult, and I think the fertilizer sector is is a great example of that. Yeah, questions. Uh, uh, actually, uh, so far as uh, urea subsidy is concerned for the agriculture farmer, hmm. uh, I'm actually concerned with uh, the you know irrigated land. Uh, actually, it is very skewed. Uh, in India, so uh, what you have is there? Any, basically, my question is pointed. Uh, is there any kind of rationalisation being done regarding you know uh, distribution of uh, uh, urea or the subsidies regarding that with regard to irrigated land, so that it is a clear justice to the you know, uh, farmers who are not getting any other benefits as well. So, so, so is your question that the more irrigated the land, the less subsidy you should get? Is, is that what you're, yeah. Actually, somehow, you know, it is justified to get local <laughs> Yeah, you, you see, uh, uh, you, uh, this is what, what is, you know, you, you've kind of uh, uh, asked a very good question, but also a question where, you know, we want to, you know, when you think about, you know, how do we do this, yours goes in the direction of more complication. You know, then you say, okay, I have a urea, but then I will find out where it's irrigated and where it's not irrigated. And, and you know, so, so in terms of implementation, that gets very difficult to do. So in principle, so when we come to the UBI section, this is precisely the kind of, you know, we want to think, oh, there's some ideal beneficiary, we have to get it only to him and not to someone else. And we devise all kinds of schemes to try and do that. But you know, it ends up leading to misallocation and leakages and so on. So, so, so uh, simplicity, uh, uh, I think, is probably the way to go. But, uh, uh, but certainly, but certainly, the point that you want to, you know, you want to use uh, you fertilize the policy to to neutralize income distribution, which I think it's it's very gets very complicated. See, I think that, uh, as I said, uh, subsidies benefit some and not others. Uh, I think that there could be, uh, you know, good social reasons for doing that. But I think the important thing is that we must do a cost-benefit analysis. You know, 
We get some benefit, but we pay a cost. And this cost-benefit analysis we should do constantly. And you know, as we go through this, you'll see what you know. Uh, I don't want to flesh out the explanation in greater detail because as we go through this, you will see uh, what the benefits and costs are of doing something like uh, the Amma Kanti. But you know, actually, remember the uh, you know this whole um, uh, midday meal scheme. Uh, I don't know whether it began with the Tamil politician or the Andhra politician. Was it N.T. Ramarao or MGR who first started the midday meal scheme? Kamra Sad. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, like everyone, we are talking about that uh, mid meal, mid meal school, uh, like school meals, like uh, introduced by Kamraj, MGR. Yes, actually originated from Tamil Nadu only. 1929, 1929. Uh, no, like um, uh, retired Malay senior, he was the uh, member of council in the British. Okay, good. So he actually retired Malay senior, wasn't he? Actually introduced this. Uh, see, this see, team, but Kamraj and uh, MGR, they developed, they, so, they established. So, 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 so you know what this tells me? That in your classroom, you should ask someone to do a historical origin of, you know, of the midday meal scheme. Yeah. It would be a wonderful project. Huh? No, seriously, I would love to know about it. I really would. I'm not joking. Sir, but it's a great project. Huh? Sir, uh, being, uh, one, 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 one. Sorry, let, let, let her finish and then we come to you. Yeah? Uh, Mike, meanwhile, if you could get the mic here. Yeah? Um, sir, when we're saying that 9% is actually lost to the inefficient firms, uh, how are we defining this uh, inefficiency? Is it only in terms of cost? Yeah. Uh, or cost relative to... Yeah, so it's cost relative to the international price because that's the opportunity cost of resources because you could uh, either uh, use resources to produce it domestically or you could save those resources and so what is the cheapest alternative source? That's the, that's the subsidy. That's how you calculate the subsidy, you know, there's a market price and the price that you pay. In this case, uh, the efficient cost of production is one metric would be the imported price, landed imported price. But and that's the standard way of doing it. It's not a, a very fancy or a complicated thing at all. Because that's what you want to measure it against, what the, the, you know, the lowest cost of production would be. Um, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, being from a farmer family, I just want to raise this point, and that is from Haryana. Hmm. Uh, can we think about the crop specific fertilizer subsidy because if you f uh, think that you know here I am trying to get away from complexity you want to you know just think of the implementation difficulties um, my question is regarding the definition of farmers that we follow because uh, many times you know uh, while distributing in subsidies we don't follow the census definition of farmers all we are concerned about the land holding so here in this whole realm uh, landless laborers, landless farmers are missing their opportunities here and they are the most victimized of these cancers and other things as well. So how we can bring them in the thing there? See, a first point is that this subsidy, anyone, even a landless farmer can go and say, give me the subsidy, give me fertilizer at the subsidized price and he can sell it uh, to whoever he wants. So in that sense, this doesn't discriminate whether you're small farmer or, or big farmer. Uh, so, or no farmer. Yeah, or no farmer, exactly, or no farmer. Uh, no farmer, exactly, or no farmer. Uh, but th the point that you raise is, you know, is a much bigger point, right? How do you, you know, improve the livelihood and incomes of uh, those who don't have land? Uh, and that is a question, you know, it relates to how we should develop the agricultural sector, how we should develop the manufacturing sector, how we should get them to move, what their skills should be. And those are things we'll touch upon both in the agriculture and the manufacturing uh, modules that we do later on. Uh, I think I'm going to move on now, uh, unless there are, you know, let me, let me move on and then maybe at the end when we take a break we can do this. So, the first year of the survey that I did, that my team and I did, we documented all these subsidies and we spoke about jam uh, and, and all of that. When we went around presenting this all over India, I think the question came back, you know, why do you only document and talk about the subsidies that the poor are getting? What about the subsidies that the, you know, others are getting, the middle class and the rich? And that was a very fair uh, critique of, uh, of us. And so we said, so in the, in the second survey we did, that is in 2016, so, I forget, it's uh, two years ago, not the latest one, the previous one. Uh, we said, okay, let's have a go at documenting uh, the subsidies that go to the relatively well off. And this is what the uh, finance minister mentioned in the speech that you know this created uh, this generated a, a nice discussion on this. And now this is kind of a, a little bit like a pedagog pedagogical device that I would use 
uh, for teaching students. I think when we think about a subsidy, and this kind of answers the question that you raised as well about the uh, Amma canteen, sir. This is, you know, it's kind of response to that as well. So one way of thinking about is what are the benefits and what are the costs of subsidies, right? So. Uh, n n not in, in, a, in a narrow sense, in a very narrow sense, and I'm going to define what that narrow sense is. So if you give a subsidy uh, on a particular commodity, the benefit could be that uh, how much of it is consumed by the poor, right? So the benefit, so in this, remember in all of this when we give subsidies, at the back of our mind we have some target group. You know, the bottom 30%, bottom 40%, that you can define on your own. For the purpose of illustration here, we say that the target group is, say, the bottom 30 to 40%. And by the way, the NSSO data will allow you in your classroom to give the data to your students and say, no, let's do the same exercise if, say, my target group is 60%. Uh, and, and the target group is 70%, that's an exercise that you can do in your classroom based on this analysis that we do here. So we measure the benefit is, so if you're doing say, for, uh, let's say food, Amma canteen for example, food, you say bottom 30%, how much of their expenditure goes on food? If they consume 50% of their expenditure on food, then that's a, that's a subsidy that will have, from a social welfare point of view, a lot of benefit. But if the group is only consuming 10%, maybe it will have less. So that's the benefit. But then the cost, cost comes in is, is the leakage. One thing is, so if you spend 100 rupees on, um, on the Amma canteen, you know, uh, all the rich people, for example, in, in the neighborhood that I live in, in Chennai, there's no, nothing that prevents the rich people also from going and eating in Amma's canteen. So that's a leakage because you, you, it's meant for the poor. So one way of measuring the leakage is what fraction of the total spending does not go to the target group, goes to the non-target group. And this we simply measure as total consumption of the uh, target group versus uh, uh, as a share of total consumption. And one way we illustrate this is a simple benefit cost ratio. You say this is the benefit, what proportion of expenditure of those households is spent on this. The cost is how much of total consumption does that group represent as a proportion of total? Because the more, uh, so on the right hand side, the cost increases. It says what fraction of total is by the non poor, by the non target group. So if the non target group is consuming more of the commodity, it's a it's a bad, it's a cost. Uh, if this commodity is very important to the consumption market of the target group, benefit that's good. So essentially, you want to provide subsidies to items that ideally are, are here in this area. And you don't want to provide subsidies to items that are here. Right, so, th so that's, the, that's kind of the, um, uh, that's kind of, so this is a kind of theoretical, uh, graphical way of, of doing a kind of cost benefit analysis, you know, uh, so, so it would be nice to do it for, with taking Tamil Nadu data, how much of uh, spend expenditure of the households is on Amma Canteen, for example, uh, and see how much is uh, spent. So, <clears throat> but here's the, here's the interesting thing. The subsidy is not, we said this before, is not always the explicit. So when you give money to someone, that's a subsidy. But you can also have a subsidy which says that, for example, you are so, supposed to, pay this tax, but I'm not charging you that tax, and that's an implicit subsidy as well. Because, you know, you're departing from some normal, so your benchmark could be the cost, or it could be the normal tax rate that you have to pay, and that's, so uh, the higher the benefit cost ratio, the greater is the case for subsidization of the commodity. Now, give you, uh, we've spoken about gold, for example. It turns out, you know, this is from the NSSO data, the top decile, the top two deciles consume 80% of the total gold share. So we know by definition that if you tax gold at anything less than the normal rate, you will be giving a huge implicit subsidy to the non-target group because they are consuming most of the gold. Uh, so, so this was the argument that we used in the, in the um, in the, in the uh, report that I did on, on the GST. But remember that uh, 
so in this, the comparison should be against a normal tax of 26% today. Uh, in the, uh, in the, when the GST comes in, the normal rate would be 18. But today, the normal rate on most goods is 12 and a half on excise, about 14 on, on, on uh, VAT. So the normal tax is 26. And today, we charge about 1 to 1.6%. 1 so the implicit subsidy on gold is that much. It is it's basically 2 minus 26 times the total amount consumed by, uh, by the non-poor, which is a huge amount. Now, so, so I want to, you know, this, this is a similar calculation we can do for, you know, uh, a, 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 a aviation, uh, you know, who really travels. You know, we actually uh, provide a subsidy to uh, aviation turbine fuel. Uh, because, you know, in the case of aviation turbine fuel, the only point I would make, we know, for example, the poor don't travel by, by plane. Uh, but the interesting thing is that what should be the comparison point for it? Should it be, uh, so? because remember, in the case of petroleum products, we charge a much higher tax. A, a higher normal tax because you know these things create pollution, etc., uh, etc. Et it's bad for the environment. So these are considered demerit goods. So if you were to make the the, the comparison, something like uh, you know what is a normal charge on petroleum, which is maybe like 50, 60 percent, then you know again you will see that the implicit subsidy could be quite uh, could be quite high for for the rich. But the, I think now. You can get, you can subsidize by relative to, on the indirect tax side. So, you know, gold and aviation fuel are indirect taxes. They're paid by consumers in some way. But you also can give implicit subsidies in the form of foregone income tax. Uh, so if you don't pay income taxes uh, uh, or you get an exemption, then that is also like a subsidy. Now, uh, <clears throat> I, here, the point I want to make is a, a very simple point. By definition, an income tax benefits not the rich, not the very rich, not the very, very, very rich, but the very, 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 very rich for one simple reason. Why? Because we show in the economic survey, and this again, something we did a first uh, analysis last year, which should be updated, is that even the lowest slab of income taxpayer in our estimate lies in the top 5% of the Indian income distribution. So one of the really interesting things about India is that the middle class taxpayer thinks of himself as middle class and poor. You know, uh, but uh, actually, if you're, paying, if you're paying even the lowest tax on the income distribution, you find that you are actually very, very rich. So any income tax exemption that we give is by definition a, a, a subsidy that leaks because it doesn't go to the target group because the target group is not even remotely close to paying taxes. It goes to the very, very rich. So we use this to calculate, for example, in the case of small, we have a lot of small saving schemes, i.e. you know, uh, post office, Provident Fund, it's a big one. We give these uh, uh, both uh, better uh, interest rates and we give a tax exemption. So in this case, suppose you, you add together the better interest rate that you get and the tax exemption that you get against what a normal return should be in a bank deposit or a government bond, we find that there's a huge subsidy to uh, these so-called small savers, so-called middle-income class people who are actually at the very top end of the income distribution. And so, so what we did, so this is something that's, uh, so, so just to give you a, again, this is again a pedagogical device. So uh, we have a benefit cost ratio calculation. Remember we did benefit, we did cost, divide one by the other. So you can get a benefit cost ratio. And we know that, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the higher the benefit cost ratio, the, the lower to be, should be the tax. So the more, the more you go on this side, the more you should be here. So, so here the benefit cost ratio is high, and therefore you should have, it would justify a, a, a high subsidy because subsidies are this side, taxes are going this side. So if you have low benefit cost, like here diesel, and broadly what we find is that, you know, the income Indian pattern is not too far away from that, you know. Uh, petrol clearly, uh, you know, is taxed uh, maybe uh, more than it should be. This seems 
kerosene uh, and LPG seem to be subsidized too much relative to the benefit cost ratio. So this is a way of just, you know, what should be the benefit, what is the benefit cost ratio? What is the effective tax rate? And what should be the desirable tax rate? You can kind of do a comparison on this. And, and, and this is one way of doing it. And of course, uh, what we did in the survey, you know, I told you, we put together all the subsidies to the non-target group. And as an illustrative calculation, we said, one lakh crores, which is, you know, which is not, and the reason why the minister referred to this was that, I mean, uh, this at least, I mean, the number may not be exactly right. You have to redo the calculation, but uh, it gives you a sense of, you know, let's just not focus just on the subsidies to the poor. We do a lot for some, you know, the undeserving rich, uh, and, and in any political discussion, I think we need to keep this in mind. Uh, uh, and of course, all those Marxists out there. Uh, so, in the first year, when the first year survey came out, uh, you know, uh, the authors of the economic survey were called anti-poor to redeem our Marxist credentials. Uh, we then did this. Now we can pretend to be both Marxists and capitalists at the same time. That's the advantage of being able to do two, three surveys. You can cover all your bases. And, and after having done this, I feel immune to all the attacks from Marxists as well. Question. Oh, now I know the Marxist attack is coming. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I don't know. But it's about the benefits. And I was just wondering if instead of doing just a share of expenditures in the budget. You can have weights. You can have weights, welfare weights. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because gravy is being. I, I, I see that you're doing only AC, which is. Yeah. Uh, but there are small expenditures which are important, which would, you know, would make sense to us. Uh, even if the share is not. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So, so remember, see, here's one for me, a rule of thumb for me, which I follow uh, when whatever analysis I do, it's something that I find doesn't happen enough in India. I think that when you do research or, and do these things, be bold in what you do, but be transparent in what you do, right? So. Because being because what happens is people tend to be very, very cautious. Oh, I've not got the perfect data. I don't have the perfect thing. Therefore, I will not do anything. So in this, uh, this these numbers, I know there are going to be lots of, you know, maybe, you know, uh, assumptions that could be tweaked, you know, data sources that could be better. But the point is you want to make a larger point. And you know, as long as you, you get the data and do it, so, but you have to be transparent about what you do. You know, just the data should be available. Your assumption should be clear. But you know, but you shouldn't be cautious or or you know, almost uh, cowardly in 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 saying, oh, I will not go into this because of A, B, C. So be bold and encourage your students to be bold in the way they think and they and they write and they research. Uh, but they should be transparent. This just a clarification. Uh, is there, what was the reason behind you choosing the target group as the bottom 60%? Bottom, no, bottom, we, I think in the original one we did 30, in this year we updated to the bottom 40%. Uh, um, but, 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 but the graph says it's the bottom 60% of the population. Uh, the That's benefit a, cost ratio for select, the earlier graph, ah. it says the target group is assumed as population in bottom six deciles. And the non-target group yeah. is the best uh, The answer is there, please. Uh, uh, so, so in fact, we've updated to bottom 60. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so again, remember these are alternative ways. You choose your definition of target group and do it. But here, we've done. You know, in the in the in the in the survey when we first did it, we said the target group is the bottom 30 percent. But we also did robustness checks. You know, what if we made it to the bottom 60 percent? How much would the numbers change? So, so that's my. So the, what I forgot to mention is that, be bold. Be uh, 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 transparent, but do robustness. You know, do alternative scenarios, and, and that's a way of doing this. Because, because why I ask this is because, uh, so this is NSS 11, 12. Hmm. And so if we go by the poverty line, so it's about 25%, which yeah. is the poor. So yeah. 
if you take bottom 60 percent, it includes a large proportion of the non-poor as well. Yeah, so, so in fact, so we are stacking the, the odds against us, right? So if you're saying that, you know, we consider a bigger portion as a target group, despite that if you get such high numbers, then it shows, you know, uh, we're also, we're being very, very generous even to the so-called middle class or upper middle class or whatever it is. Yes, uh, a question from there, please, yeah. Good morning, sir. Yeah. So my question is about the fertilizer subsidy. Yep. Now, such a skewed subsidy pattern, is it because uh, we are relatively dependent on imports for uh, phosphate and phosphorus and uh, we are comfortable with the domestic supply of nitrogenous uh, fertilizers or could there be any lobby pressures for the industry? Uh, you know, lobby pressures, you know, remember all, almost all of, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of rule of political economy that any kind of intervention distortion that you have is either a, uh, either started by a lobby or is being reinforced by a lobby and so so you know almost axiomatically that's true but <clears throat> you raise one i think much bigger kind of question your first question is so and it also relates to i guess the question that came here uh, the question is that you know is there some benefit from having it produced domestically rather than produced uh, imported. And it's a very complicated question. The first answer is that, you know, you should buy from the cheapest source, you know, especially here you want to favor the farmer, right? You want to favor the farmer. Because if you don't, then you're going to, uh, uh, going to have uh, cost associated with that. But then you, if you have some reason why it's you know, you can say there's some social benefits to producing domestically, then you get into a different kind of calculation. In the case of fertilizer, I cannot see any social benefit to producing because even you see the employment numbers are so poor. And the only possible reason, or as it began originally, is food security. You say, you know, fertilizer is important for food security, for food, food security is very important, and therefore you want to do this. So you could, you could get into all these complicated chains of, you know, why you want to subsidize, uh, and that's why we are where we are. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, cost of production of uh, fertilizer per unit, that is also very high, sir. No, 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 so, so I, I can tell you what the cost of, you know, we know for all the companies, we, we know the data. We know the data on the cost. These are the costs. We know these are all the inefficient ones, and the ones below are the efficient ones, because that red line is the imported price. <laughs> Almost virtually nobody there. So, so maybe you say a little bit, you know, we give some protection, and even then you would have a... Yeah, uh, yeah, a question, a question, or oh, now my familiar friends are raising themselves, uh, but, but let's, let's ask a question here, and then we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to the other questions, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, see the fertilizer sector, it's, I mean, a lot of inefficiency has been uh, injected through the subsidies, that is one part of the story. And the other part is that as a manufacturing sector, it has gained a lot of efficiency, especially in terms of energy use, it has become really efficient. So is it the case that uh, the farms who are not efficient, they're actually coming from the unorganized sector because- No, no, these, these are all, they're all organized, all organized. Yeah, so the ASI, for the ASI data, they are really becoming, uh, you know, efficient. So how this paradox can be explained? Um, um, the, this is latest data. So they may be becoming more efficient and they could still be very inefficient relative to world oh, prices, okay. to the cheap, yeah. So that's, I think the, yeah, uh, please that are made about fertilizer subsidies also uh, applicable to food subsidy or do we make a distinction uh, because uh, the nature of commodity in question is different poor spend a lot large share of their incomes into food and also recently studies have shown that uh, leakages have reduced in terms of uh, food subsidies so can we say that if leakages are indeed reduced or covered we will have uh, no issues with food subsidies um, is it, is it yeah, yeah. Good, good, very good question. I mean, how does the food versus um, fertilizer? Uh, a, I deliberately chose fertilizer over food for a reason. Uh, uh, food is a bit more complicated, I think. Um, I, and if you don't mind, when we do the UBI, we'll get into this. But certainly, I think that, remember, there are lots of distinctions. One, food is more important uh, uh, for the poor. Uh, second, it's limited. It's not an unlimited subsidy like it is for fertilizer. Third, we have a p elaborate system of PDS, 
uh, which as you rightly say, you know, in the past there were lots of leakages, but I think there has been some improvement over time, but it's still, uh, you know, far from having uh, solved that problem. But also, you know, I think that there are benefits from protecting consumers against the vagaries of prices, because remember, in, in the case of the, of the NFSA, you not only guarantee uh, some quantity, you also guarantee a price. So, so you know, there are all kinds of, uh, you know, so it's more complicated. Uh, the net uh, cost benefit, uh, you know, we should look at more carefully. But it is quite different from fertilizer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in one of the chapter you write that uh, the taxes should be on savings like EET, exempt, yeah. exempt and taxes. So on bank savings as of now we are paying on both uh, TET kind of thing because uh, interest is also taxable and so is savings. So if we make EET, is it for equity also because equity is also one form of savings where we are paying corporate income tax effectively or at the time of dividend distribution. So. TET should be, uh, rather EET should be both bank and bank savings and equity or only the bank savings? See, in terms of savings, I think the two ones that are kind of neutral are TEE and EET. So yeah. I basically at some point you have to pay taxes, either when you put it in or when you take it out. Um, the, the corporate tax thing, see, in principle, see, in principle that um, the returns after tax returns to all forms of financial instruments must be equalized, right? Um, so in that sense, I, I think we should have a system that does that. But in the case of uh, uh, equity, it gets, I mean, the calculation gets more complicated because, you know, first there's the corporate profit, there's the withholding, and then, you know, there's the dividend distribution, and then, you know, so, so it gets a little bit more complicated in terms of how, but the principle is that, you know, after tax returns should be equalized and the tax system should not distort that in any way. So EET should be for equity as well. Uh, uh, a, a version of that. Politically tough, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah.